and I remember the bay we went into, there wasn't a soul in sight. It was absolutely empty. And then a small flag crept up to the top of a pole at a signal station at the entrance to the bay, and then suddenly what had been an entirely empty saucer of snow was peopled, and people skied down to the water's edge and started coming off in their boats uh, to, to be taken on board us. And it went for us very quickly. We sat in the boat on the land and took folk on board in the boat on board on the destroyer. Og disse stedene er jo rolig innelukket farevann, så det var ikke noe problem å få det ombord. Og efter en par timer så var de som skulle ombord, de var kommet ombord, og da gikk vi til Murmans med forhold til stor fart. As we entered Murmansk, we saw a very desolate uh, picture. Uh, the town was rather small, and uh, it was just an outpost town. And it was a nice harbor, but suddenly a destroyer pulled alongside us in the harbor, and uh, they unloaded some strange-looking people. And we learned that they were Norwegians and that they had been picked up by the British Navy from the island of Soraya. Det skulle gå en konvoi et par dager etterpå, og de ble da fordelt på en 15-20 mennesker på hvert handelsfartøy. Blant annet så kom det 19 folk ombord i Henry Bacon, som var en amerikansk båt. Henry Bacon var fortunat nok til å akvare 19 av de survivors. Contact with the Norwegians was on a daily basis. They'd see us on the ship and they'd nod and laugh and smile. Some of the men enjoyed cigarettes, we'd give them smokes. All the kids enjoyed chocolate bars and candy and so on. We gave them everything we had. We had a lugar for sure in the whole family. So, we thought it was good at the forhold. Etter det som vi hadde levd under før, da vi lå i de hulene, for eksempel, oppe på Sørøya. Så det, det var jo fint, og god mat var det jo ombord i den båten der, Henry Baker. Vi hadde en serie av gales, rekordet som det verste av alle russiske konvoier som hadde skjedd. På grunn av vettet, verre skip bare ikke holde en stedig kurs. And in the case of the Henry Bacon, she had awful mechanical and rudder problems as well. So she was way out. Hail, sleet, snow, winds of over 100 miles an hour. The seas were 60 to 70 foot. One minute you could see everything around you, the next minute you saw absolutely nothing but green water. Around the clock we'd been working for three days at least. And most of us without any sleep, sometimes we did get a nap. We might even sleep standing up because it was so rough that you couldn't even stay in a bunk. When the storm started to abate is when we first saw the squadron of JUH come in. It was 23 of them. They were searching for the convoy. Well, they were also misguided by the storm because they didn't find the convoy. They found the Henry Bacon instead. They were coming from every direction. Fortunately for us, we were able to shoot five of them down in flames. We saw them crash. And four of them went off smoking and belching flame. When the hit came to the Henry Bacon, I had just returned to the very bowels of the ship. The torpedo hit in the hole just ahead of this, and it actually bulged in the bulkhead, separating me from that explosion. So I went up the ladder and got up there so quickly that there was still debris in the air. My first thoughts were those poor Norwegians 
I had no idea how quickly we might sink or what might become of them. It was a mad rush to get all the Norwegians into the one lifeboat that was still serviceable, that hadn't been shot up and broke up with the storm. So we put all the women and children in there with five or six of our own crewmen. So da så vi lik og blå og alt mulig på bakdekket. Det lå og fløyt der. Og det var jo ikke noe hyggelig syn der. Og da ble jeg bare puffet over rekka, vet du. For det var så mye sjø, det var jo en 15-20 meters bølga. Så bare jeg fast i lina, så jeg ble hengende litt over rekka. Mannskapet ombord, vet du, de hadde ikke noe å kutte med, så. Men fatteren hadde en sånn kniv, vet du, på siden. Så han kuttet på det, og så jeg falt bare ombord i båten, altså. Captain Carini ordered me to go into the lifeboat with the Norwegians. It was very difficult. It was, I had become so close with Captain Carini, and normally I would be staying on board as long as the ship was afloat. As I went into the lifeboat, he, he looked me in the eye and said, uh, you are to erect an antenna, be the person that uh, sends out the signals that will hopefully bring rescue. As soon as we hit the water, it became very rough in the lifeboat. Atmosfæren var jo sånn at det, at det var jo stille blant oss. Da var det jo foreldrene våre, de skrek jo og ba til, til Gud og at det han skulle gå bra. The order came out to abandon ship. My chief engineer followed over to me, get in that lifeboat, cut that lashing line, and get that boat into the water. Uh, the minute I stepped up on the bow of the lifeboat and I hit it with a fire axe, a sea come in, hit me and the lifeboat, and we went over the side. The temperature was over 45 below zero. It was snowing in a gale. You saw nothing, heard nothing, except for the wind howling across the sea. After we had been in the lifeboat for maybe 20 minutes, I could see the ship, well, the bow just suddenly raised up in the air and it slid peacefully into the sea. But it was very, very emotional for me to know there were people on it that did not survive. I did wave goodbye to the captain and he waved back. And that was the last time I saw him. Og kapteinen, han ble igjen, vet du, oppe på brua. Han vinket bare til oss. Og det husker man jo mye godt. Det var jo litt... litt dramatisk. My main problem was to get from one end of the lifeboat to the other without stepping on someone because I had to connect an antenna at both ends of the lifeboat. Finally, I got it uh, erected and got the transmitter in operation and I started sending out the signal. On camp, on, uh var jo en av dem som holdt hodet kaldt sammen med far, far vår, så fikk den eh, livbåten ut fra skutesida, så den gikk ned i dragsuken når den, hovedbåten gikk ned. But 24, I believe, or not. The captain, the chief engineer, never left the ship. They went down with the ship. And I witnessed the sinking of it because after only maybe 15 or 20 minutes of being in the water, uh, suddenly the bow of the ship just raised up in the air and it just slid peacefully into the sea. They were very still when the boat had gone down and we were lying there in the boat. So now we have to sing a bit of a Christian song. We tried to do it at least. It's not true. You do it when you're in a very critical situation. Så tyr man jo til de gule og, og sånn.
We were in the lifeboat about three hours when we saw the HMS Opportune pull up in the uh, in the almost darkness of the of the Arctic Ocean. There was a lot of euphoria. The people were screaming and hollering and holding up their hands and waving to the British on the shore. And it was a great feeling. It was just you can't I can't really describe the feeling we had. After the worst journey on record, the ships with survivors sailed thankfully into the Clyde.